Good morning, everyone. My name is Steve Diamond. It's October 5th, 2017. We're at the Computer History Museum in Mountain View, California, to record an oral history of the RCA 1800 microprocessor family. We've assembled a panel with broad experience in the RCA microprocessor family who will be talking to you today. Dick Sanquini, who is a partner at Lightcap, will be the moderator of the panel. Paul Russo, who is chairman and founder of Geo Semiconductor Inc. Nick Kuchareski, who is an independent semiconductor professional. Dick Ahrens, president of Dacon Associates. Thanks to all the panelists for joining us for this oral history. Dick Sanguini, I'll hand the microphone over to you. Uh, good morning, and thank you, Steve. Uh, we're here to discuss RCA's 1800 family. Uh, this is the world's uh, first CMOS microprocessor and had a lot of firsts in the industry, first in space, first in under the hood ignition control for automobiles. And as Steve pointed out, we have Dr. Dick Ahrens, Dr. Paul Russo, Nick Kuchareski, and myself, Dick Sanquini. Now what's a common thread between all of us is that we all had careers at RCA, and uh, we at various times during a period of 1971 through 1985 uh, worked on the RCA 1800 family. Uh, uh, today what we're gonna do is discuss the how and why RCA got involved in microprocessors. Then we're going to look at the commercialization and the challenges, technical challenges, that we had in delivering the, the microprocessor. Uh, also, we'll talk about some cool applications for the microprocessors, include many pioneering firsts. And then the RCA contributions to the industry, of which many were made with this family. Uh, and finally, uh, we're going to talk about the RCA 1800 in light of a very successful, a, a very unsuccessful uh, CPU in the industry, uh, but uh, an innovative and very leading product uh, that is still working today, and we'll talk about that a little bit more. So what I'm going to do now is ask each, uh, each of us to introduce ourselves individually, and we can start at your end with Dick. Uh, Dick, g give us your introduction. Well, I've spent uh, like over 50 years in the semiconductor industry, started from day one when I graduated and joined RCA Labs. Um, I went to RCA Labs and, in 1954 and started with transistors. In fact, RCA was mainly like in TV, so I was doing TV horizontal deflection at that time, and that was 54. I continued at RCA uh, till uh, 1964 when I transferred over to the RCA Solid State Division, and I ran a sizable group there developing CMOS, uh, different aspects of CMOS. This RCA had many groups doing CMOS. Okay, the product group, there was the advanced development, what we called at that time, became the technical uh, arm, and RCA Labs. And RCA Labs had, had many groups in addition. So a lot of fingerprints on the 1802. Okay. Uh, subsequently, when I left uh, RCA in 69, uh, which is around the birth of Intel. And um, I started my own company and then ended up with Motorola in their semiconductor uh, operation in Austin, Texas, which had two groups there. It had the CMOS group, which competed with RCA, and it had the microprocessor group. I had been being in the CMOS group but I also was very close with the microprocessor people, and I saw Motorola's development of the microprocessor. And then the eminent Dick Sanquiti got me back to RCA 
um, in about uh, 78 ish, and I spent about three and a half, four years at RCA. And then after that, went over to Burroughs, uh, and, and then I did further work in the semiconductor field. So I've had a lot of background in processors, not only at RCA. And maybe I, my feeling of the 1802, it was successful, but not super successful when you compare it to the Motorola 6800 family, Intel's um, i86 today, um, but it was a success. Okay, thanks, Dick and Paul. Okay, so let me start with my uh, PhD work at Berkeley in the late 60s, when actually uh, a bunch of graduate students that I was part of were working on the first generation of using computers to design LSI chips. And uh, it was the first time people did that. And we had uh, a stack of four boxes, you know, 8,000 cars to feed the mainframe and foot high things. And uh, after that, I spent a year teaching and taught the initial courses on computer design at Berkeley. And then I was hired by RCA Labs in Princeton to work on mainframe architecture systems and, and all that. Because as you know, in those days, in 1970, in the fall, when I joined RCA, there were a very large mainframe supplier. And we were all very keen and enthusiastic uh, young scientists, so to speak. So on a fateful day, September 17th, 1971, I did my usual, which I would go to the office on a Saturday for a few hours to catch up. So I bought my New York Times on the way to the office, parked my car, as I'm walking in, I read the headlines, RCA exits mainframe business. So I turned around and went back home. And that week, uh, that Monday, uh, the whole big group was saying, well, what the hell do we do now? And uh, Joe Weisbecker, who was one of the real inventive guys in that group. Uh, you know, he was funny. He looked down on PhDs. He thought academics doesn't help invention, you know, and uh, would always have these philosophical arguments. But uh, he says, look, I've been working on this thing at home for a while. The idea, because of LSI's far enough along, we can stop putting enough gates on a chip to really have a something that I'm going to call a microprocessor. This is before Intel ever announced their 4004. So our management, at that time led by Bob Winder, said, well, we just got out of the computer business. Um, okay, okay, but don't tell anyone you're working on computers. And so we went off and did that and built, um, and I got some pictures here we can discuss later, built a TTL version of, of Joe's architecture and, that, and start uh, working after that on various uses for that, including video games, communication systems, and so on. And um, uh, and around, I guess, uh, similar time, the other groups, as Dick mentioned in, at the RCA Labs, who were also left with that little to do, we started focusing on the more physical design and semiconductor aspects of this. And then Somerville got involved, which is the RCA Semiconductor Division, and, and took it to become a real product. And after which I focused on mainly on applications. Now the problem, and why I think it was not as big a success as it could have been, uh, I will put the blame on the senior RCA management. Oh, well, can we, because yeah. I want to introduce uh, okay. the rest Okay, sorry, of the panel. Let's we'll discuss we're, that we're later. Gonna get in, no, we're going to get into it in a few minutes, uh, but I think we have a good feel for your background, and I, that's what I was just right. trying, sorry. trying to do. So Nick, tell us about your okay. background. Well, I joined RCA Solid State in uh, 1973 as a design engineer in the custom chip group. Uh, in that group, I actually designed the first generation Chrysler Lean Burn Ignition Controller. Um, and I also designed the first generation Bosch Motronic Ignition Controller. Both of those products would end up being the first generation, followed by an 1802 based solution uh, a few years later. And so uh, we'll be talking about the 1802 based solution in a little bit. Um, but that was actually pretty exciting. Uh, I also designed other custom chips for automotive applications, uh, a few other different ignition controllers, dashboard electronics, things like that. Uh, communications chips, consumer applications, that kind of thing. Uh, then I managed the custom design group for a few years and managed those kinds of products. And then I went on to manage what we called at the time LSI engineering, which consisted of memories, microprocessors, microprocessor peripherals, and custom chips. Uh, following RCA, I was VP of technology centers and VP and GM of communications products 
at VLSI Technology. Uh, so again, as Technology Center VP, I was uh, responsible for tech centers worldwide and, and actually extended up my custom capability with VLSI's semi-custom tools and, and really tried to grow that market. Uh, following uh, VLSI, I joined the Xilinx where I was VP and GM of the complex PLD business unit. Uh, following Xilinx, I was VP GM of microprocessors at IDT, uh, where we really exploited the uh, MIPS RISC processor as our base processor family. Uh, I also ran a uh, startup called uh, Cognition Corporation as president and CEO, uh, which was a network processor startup back in the good old days. Uh, following that, I consulted at several startups, but uh, I really enjoyed doing now is restoring antiques and building furniture. And I found that making sawdust is a lot of rewards over building chips and selling chips. So that's kind of a I like brief that. history. <laughs> I like that too. <laughs> okay, I'm Dick Sanquini. And uh, at RCA, I was the GM of the microprocessor and memory business from 1975 to 1980. And uh, today, I'm a partner at Lightcap, Cap, Lightcap which is an equity fund. And uh, we focus on uh, late stage technology startups. And, and what I do is help build these young co companies and prepare them for IPOs and, uh, and or acquisitions. So um, in between times, uh, I did work for National Semiconductor, ran their microprocessor efforts, uh, actually CEO of some startups and, uh, and started doing what I do today in the year 2000 when I left National. Thank you. Okay, let's get this started. Now we can continue. How okay. did how did this uh, how did the 1800 family get started? You you touched on some of the things. Yes. Let's, let's go back and talk about. Okay. That. Yeah. So, like I said, on September uh, 17th, which I believe was a Saturday, I was doing my you know I've been at RCA about a year, and we're these young, keen, technical people, and we went in on Saturdays. Bought my New York Times on the way in. Reading the paper after parking my car, walking to the building, and I read the headline, RCA leaves the mainframe business. So we said, well, I might as well go back home. And that week, uh, we were all wandering around. That there are many groups at RCA Labs, um, you know, like Dick mentioned, not just the architecture mainframe group. We're focused on mainframe hardware and uh, microcode to speed up instructions and that kind of stuff. So uh, we were all wandering around, what do we do? And then. Joe, Joe Weisbecker, who was really one of the most inventive people that I've ever met, and we were actually good friends. We'd have lunch every day and stuff and argue a lot. Um, he said, look, I've been thinking about this because he, he hated exercise. What he liked to do was lie on the couch and read. And he would read lots of stuff. And he was always tinkering and getting new ideas about my um, uh, electronics in particular. He said, look, I've been sketching out th something that I think we can now build on a chip that we'll call a microprocessor that we can use for games, for other applications and stuff. So wh when did he do that? What, what, because I believe Intel, Intel takes credit for the first microprocessor. When did Joe actually uh, it, it, had, you know, lay out that idea? I don't believe the 14, four, uh, 4004 Intel had been announced yet. This was, he started that work back in early 70, like, like uh, probably a year and a half or two before RCA exited the mainframe business. And he did it on his own because he was really involved with a mainframe group, mainframe hardware group. So, but I believe at that time there were a number of other companies also have the same idea. Hey, LSI is moving forward. We can now create enough gates to, to do something that's programmable. But RCA, because it was a pioneer in CMOS technology, I uh, uh, said, well, let's do it in CMOS, which has many benefits, and that gave rise to the world's first CMOS microprocessor. And um, so once the thing became uh, in, on the path to become a product, uh, the solid state division really took over the lead, and uh, RCA Labs were mainly supporting them. But, but in the labs, what, what specifically did you develop in the lab? Okay, the first thing we developed was a, a TTL box about this size, that was in effect yep. um, a uh, breadboard of what will become the 1800 series microprocessor. And the funny thing was, 
which I mean, these days it's, it's, you tell my kids that and they can't believe it. The way you entered a thousand bytes of code was you had eight switches and flick them to ones and zeros and push enter. Did it a thousand times. And we're getting so tired of that that I actually designed a hex keyboard to speed it up by a factor of four. You cannot put in eight, F, or E, whatever. And, uh, but we used that and we developed games and other software on that to demonstrate all the various things uh, that it could do. And this also served, uh, I think, to prove out the architecture, catch any bugs and so on, uh, as uh, other parts of the labs and, and the solid state division began to create uh, the real product. And other groups at RCA uh, um, labs, mainframe guys, started writing I remember John O'Neill's group, and he ran the big software stuff, so running some software and assemblers and things, because the initial programming was all, all machine code. And boy, uh, <laughs> these days people say, what is that? Um, and, then, and then as it became real, um, I became head of microsystems research and started focusing mainly on applications of microprocessors. And uh, my, uh, and if I just turn the clock forward a little bit, in 1979, a year before the IBM PC, my group actually developed a prototype home computer. Uh, we were going to use the 8080 from Intel, and we had Bill Gates there for a whole day because we we're going to use DOS. We bring in the New York guys, the, the senior management. They look at it and they said, "We can't sell this the way we sell TVs. TVs back then were basically furniture, huge, bulky things." And that's when I said, "Adios, RCA." But I think that was a problem all along. Uh, the, the management in the 70s uh, preferred to have banquet foods and corner carpet and Hertz rent a car and um, as opposed to driving technology. Okay, so you know, let's get back to the T squared L box, and you know, well, yeah. we, we got to get to an 1801 well, we're gonna and an 18. Nick, how let's get to 1801. Yeah, at the time, uh, RCA was was really big in, in CMOS. Uh, we had a CD4000 family of uh, Logic products in CMOS, uh, basically built on a 10 micron metal gate process. Uh, seems like it's way huge compared to today's technology, but that's what it was. And um, as Paul mentioned, uh, RCA went out of the mainframe business, uh, but our design group down in Palm Beach Gardens had a bunch of engineers. And so there's a team down there that was assigned working with the labs to actually build the CMOS version of Weisbecker's uh, processor. And uh, they used our 10 micron CMOS process, ended up having to build a two chip system because you, with 10 micron you could not fit it all on one chip. And so they built a two chip implementation of the 1801, uh, which was then used as basically a, a tool for uh, writing software, as, as, as Paul mentioned, as well as demonstrating the chip capability to potential customers and things like that. Uh, the interesting thing is the first sort of demo product that Joe actually built, Weisbecker, was called FRED, which stands for Flexible Recreational Educational Device. And this was a briefcase sized uh, system that used a cassette tape for storing data, had a video interface uh, that took up to a TV. And so you can actually program and play games uh, on, a, on a TV set you know, with bitmap graphics, uh, which was kind of an interesting way to demonstrate this microprocessor, this brand new microprocessor. Um, uh, it was about that time that, that uh, the division started getting really interested in, in this new thing called a microprocessor. And, and at the time, I was in the custom group, and you know, custom chips at the time were, were basically done by hand. They were laborious designs. It took a long time. They were error prone. Uh, and customers always wanted programmability. They could never decide exactly what they wanted. You know, they always wanted another feature, another feature. And, and so, from our standpoint, we started thinking about a microprocessor as a replacement for custom chips. Like, we could, we could do this in a processor, program a ROM, change the ROM program anytime you want, and, and add features. And so I personally started getting really interested in the 1800 as a replacement for doing full custom logic. And what kind of design tools did you have available? And could you talk a little bit about the methodologies th at that time? For doing the chip design. Yeah. You know, for doing the chip design, the methodology was, was really primitive. I mean, we basically drew on Mylar with colored pencils and then digitized it, uh, and then plotted it out using a flatbed plotter and had to check, literally Nick. check by hand the design, the layout design versus the schematic. We had it count squares, yeah. which was, was basically squares of diffusion or whatever to yeah. 
back annotate schematics with, with resistances and capacitances and stuff like that for critical paths. And it was actually quite, quite a manual process. Um, but we got okay. the job done, and that was, the, that was the bottom line. You had mentioned to me that Andy Dingwall got into the design. Yeah, well basically, uh, so after the 1801, uh, and we started getting interested as, as And the 1801 was, was a metal gate. The 1801 yeah. was the metal, two-chip metal gate, yeah. and, and again, it was not really a production-worthy uh, part. It was, it was fairly large, even at two chips, and, and uh, really didn't have the, the, the length of, of, of viability that you needed for a, a real processor. Uh, and so it was actually a team formed between the labs people and the Solid State Technology Center to actually do an 1802, which would be a single chip version. Uh, the tech center and labs also developed a process for that. At the time, uh, Metal Gate was our t process technology of choice. Uh, they developed the first silicon gate technology, which we called C squared L, or closed CMOS logic. And that process technology actually used donut shaped transistors, where the inside of the donut was the drain, the donut was the, was the gate, was a gate, and then the outside of the gate was a source plane. And so it's self isolating, didn't require oxide isolation, didn't require diffusion isolation. And, and so it was a very high speed transistor. The problem is with multiple gates, you had to design concentric rings of poly. And as you can imagine, it really blows up pretty quickly. And so a four yeah. input gate uh, was gigantic if you did it in a conventional way. And so uh, from a design standpoint, we had to do some layout tricks and some design tricks in order to implement wide functions and that kind of thing. Uh, but it was a simple technology. It was only six photo masks, which is amazing. Six? <laughs> yeah, six. Six photo masks. Today, today we got 18 uh, metal. And so, it, <laughs> yeah. and, and so it was a you know, really cost effective technology. But again, it had some limitations in terms of density. Uh, so the combination of the C-squared-L technology and the design team head up by, uh, by Andy Dingwall in, in, in the technology center. Okay, Nick, we were talking about the labs, the tech center, the semiconductor division, which, you're, which, which was your home, and, <coughs> and actually Palm Beach Gardens, which yeah. was the manufacturing plant. And all this contributed to the 1800, and, uh, you know, we were talking about how did this all work together, you know, and, and maybe we could pick up on that. Well, it was kind of an interesting challenge because we had, you know, as we've talked about, we've had people in the tech center, uh, which was in Somerville. We had people down in Princeton Labs uh, and the Solid State Division and people down in Palm Beach Gardens. And it was kind of a distributed development team trying to pull all this stuff together. And, and uh, so one way that happened was one of the folks from the labs, Bob Winder, I actually came over the, to the division as the uh, director of that product <coughs> line and tried to pull together all these various aspects of it. Uh, the labs did, as I said, the labs did the c squared L production development and the integration under, uh, under uh, Jerry Herzog. And, uh, and we also, as, as Dick mentioned, uh, brought the process up in Palm Beach Gardens. And so we actually built the fab down in Palm Beach in the old uh, computer division. Uh, building, uh, which was kind of an interesting challenge in itself, I think. Well, why don't you talk about <laughs> that? <laughs> talk about what? <laughs> the train station. <laughs> the train station. <laughs> yeah, the, the, the fab down in Palm Beach was like 100 yards from the train tracks, uh, which is not, not the best thing in the world for uh, defining fine geometry, shall we say. Uh, but it worked, right? It, it, it worked. It was a reasonable fab. And it, and it so if the tra train didn't come, you That's right. You're okay. You have to be uh, doing your wafer alignments with in between trains. Um, but that's where we brought up the C-squared L process, and that's where we ran all the mi microprocessors and memory products, was down in Palm Beach. Um, and, and that was very successful. Uh, one way to do it is I think we transferred a number of people from Somerville down to Palm Beach to actually bring up the process. Um, and, uh, now, you talked about the disadvantage, density disadvantage, C-squared L. What were the, you can talk a little bit more about the advantages. Well, one advantage of C-squared L, if you think about it, uh, so the gate was completely surrounding the drain, and so that made the, the drain capacitance fairly small. And so these, these transistors, while they were cumbersome in, in being donut shaped, they were very fast. And so there's some speed advantages to, to that kind of uh, geometry. And uh, in addition, of course, having a six mass process, it was, it was pretty inexpensive. Uh, Nick, we sold the 1802 on the basis of low power over and over again. Uh, CMOS low power. Uh, the point described that the 18 at the C 
uh, squared L process was probably generically one of the lowest uh, leakage and power. Yeah. Well, uh, uh, you know, most processes that were that large in geometry that were CMOS were, were low leakage. I think that's, it wasn't in anything inherent in, in C squared L that was low leakage. But, but again, the key thing was that C, the Cosmec, the 1802, uh, was a fully static design, and so it could operate down to DC. And so that was actually a real advantage for people. Uh, you could actually write programs, you could single step to debug and that kind of thing. Uh, you can interface, st stop the thing at, at any time to your interface and really debug the process. So mm -hmm. it was an easy part to design with. It didn't have a lot of quirks and things like that that were present in a lot of the current N-channel uh, processors. And so a lot of people liked it. And, and so you know, we talked early on about space applications, automotive applications, applications where the noise immunity, the single stepping capability was good, and uh, and the wide tolerance, uh, the temperature range. I mean, it was, it was fairly easy to do a military temperature grade uh, ceramic packaged uh, device that, that could operate in space, that could operate in, under the hood, uh, and that kind of thing. Um, so it's, it's safe to say that <coughs> the C squared L1802 had a good speed power factor, good, right? Good speed power factor. Good speed, yeah. and that was a big advantage. The absolute voltage noise immunity, was you're saying, right. is a big advantage of that. Um, and then, of course, the fact that you don't have to consume any power. You know, you c it'll, it'll operate down to DC. Right. That, right. Those are the major, I would say, issues if we pull away yeah. 1802 verse. So that was an innovative way to make micros at that time. Certainly the first microprocessor. And it was the first CMOS microprocessor. And so uh, RCA with a CMOS technology reputation, uh, now having a CMOS microprocessor, a lot of people looked at it for those applications that really could benefit from CMOS, like space, like automotive, uh, like some industrial applications, that kind of thing. Uh, but it was a real advantage. And, and so as a company, we started to develop a lot of uh, devices to demonstrate that processor. You know, Paul alluded to some of them, but uh, we developed a micro tutor to help in the, in the classes that we taught on using microprocessors for logic design. In fact, that was the title of the course, Microprocessors for Logic Design. I'd uh, like to mention, keep Nick's thoughts in mind, because later on I'd like to say something from a marketing standpoint and what the customers were feeding back to us. Yep, yeah, so you know, we did that. Uh, Joe Weisbecker designed something called the ELF, uh, which was a hobbyist type uh, single board uh, computer that was actually published in Popular Electronics uh, to try to get a lot of people involved with understanding the 1802 and, and potentially using it uh, commercially. Uh, we did, he did several versions of the ELF, also writing software that would run on the ELF. Uh, we did a VIP, which was a single board uh, type computer that was a consumer single board computer that had graphics capability, it had hex keypads, uh, it had a cassette interface for storing programs on it. Uh, and people could buy it in kit form for uh, something like $275. And, and so it was another way to get that process route into the mainstream. Um, and I think a lot of that uh, really helped uh, get the processes designed into a lot of broad applications, not necessarily high volume applications, but a lot of different applications. I think that was the key thing. Along that line, um, I think it was uh, Herzog's group that developed a game module, okay? And uh, I obtained that for the museum, it's now at the museum, from Jerry Herzog. And by accident, uh, the Waz saw it, and he said, I played on that. <laughs> okay, so the museum does have um, the game module with the 1802. So, you know, we kind of talked about the advantages of the CMOS microprocessor and the ones you just described and what you're describing uh, really kind of set the markets that we're going to participate in. Uh, I, I guess at a high level, um, uh, the 1800 family would really fit in, well, from what you're saying, would fit into hostile environments. That's, and the two most hostile environments 
for the automotive under the hood applications and space applications. And that kind of kind of leads us into, I think, some cool applications. And we, we might want to start with the under the hood applications. And maybe, Paul, you could start on when you got involved in Nick. I, I, you know, well, I think we actually start with the custom chip. Sure. Uh, uh, I mean, in, in that uh, case, um, it was very revolutionary. It was the first um, use of a microprocessor for engine time and control. And we basically supported uh, the semiconductor division. But I can tell you some funny stories okay, where... Okay, before, before you do that, mm -hmm. let's, let's hear... It sounds like... I'm trying to get the timeline right. Yeah. yeah. Okay. It sounds like your custom chip group developed a solution right. and that you got a lot of aid, systems aid, out of the labs. Yeah, basically what so happened why there, don't you describe as that? I mentioned earlier, uh, I designed the first generation lean burn system for Chrysler. And that was a, it was kind of a hybrid analog digital system and uh, it did not do spark advance. So that, in that first generation lean burn system, it still used a centrifugal advance in, in the distributor. Um, but it was a first step to putting electronics under the hood. Uh, and that ran in production for like three years. Um, and then we went to, to them well, with... Well, on that chip, what, did you get support out of the labs? No. No, that was okay. strictly a custom chip that we had done okay. within the division okay. for Chrysler. Um, but along the same time frame, we were productizing the 1802 and went to Chrysler with the, basically an approach that they said, we, hey, we could do a 1802-based solution that'll give you a lot more programmability, a lot more flexibility. You could actually program Spark Advance uh, using the processor and, and an external ROM, that kind of thing. And so uh, we started building on, on that kind of a concept. Uh, the interesting thing is we had a capability within the division at the time uh, called automatic placement and routing. And these, these were standard cells that could be automatically placed and then routed uh, from a schematic uh, to generate a custom peripheral chip. Uh, the advantage there was very fast turnaround time so that we can implement logic, turn it around relatively quickly uh, in C squared L again, um, and, and actually provide an IO chip sample to the customer as well as having the microprocessor. Uh, the interesting thing there is that since we had built the first generation chip, we had the experience in interfacing to all the various sensors and transducers under the hood. And so that we took that interface experience, built a custom IO chip that we can then use to demonstrate true capability with the 1800 series. Along those lines, though, uh, we had a group down in Princeton that had a fully outfitted car with all the transistors, all electronics, and that kind of thing, and exp expertise on the 1800 series within Paul's group. And so in concert with the Princeton guys, we could actually bring a team to Chrysler and said, look, we've got system expertise. We've got a, an outfitted car we can demo on. We have a capability within the division to do the custom stuff and we can put it all together and design a system for you guys. Who was the competition? And there was no competition. No one was There, there was no competition at the time. Okay. Uh, TI was in talking to Chrysler about doing some other full custom stuff, uh, but we had at the time the best CMOS microprocessor. And again, this was going under the hood, and in fact it was going on top of the engine. So the Chrysler controller was actually mounted uh, on top of the engine in, in the airstream in the carburetor. And so it was a fairly uh, harsh environment, to say the least, uh, both temperature-wise as well as mechanical-wise. Uh, but again, we had the team from between our group and, and the Princeton group to actually bring a solution to, to the customer and sell them yeah. on, on that capability. So, you know what you're talking it's interesting about? that um, we know the CMOS microprocessor has got that noise immunity, and you say to yourself, Chrysler picked it up. Why didn't Ford? And why didn't um, okay um, GM. GM pick it up? Uh, okay, the answer to that was what they did is they used an NMOS micro surrounded by CMOS. The NMOS micro never talked to the outside world; it only talked through CMOS logic. And RCA sold a lot of CMOS logic to these manufacturers. Yeah. Uh, so let me add a little humor and, and color to this. So, um, you know, as, as Nick pointed out, uh, the big software group at the labs working on mainframes uh, be began to be dedicated to the microprocessors. 
after the exit from the mainframe business, headed by a guy called General O'Neill, who was basically Bob Winder's peer in the software group. And by the time we're doing the Chrysler project um, in support of, uh, of the chip business, uh, uh, they had developed an assembler on a mainframe. And uh, I remember driving around with Tony Ruby, who was the main software guy working on this project, in a car, and the software blew up. So we pulled up to a <coughs> phone booth, opened the hood, put the phone under the hood with an acoustic coupler to, to talk to the mainframe and download some code, and cars driving by, seeing this phone in the mm -hmm. engine, were saying, what the hell are these guys doing? Uh, so, so, so that was quite a real experience, and uh, we finally got it going. And I remember <coughs> Tony would spend hours to save a few bits of logic, because there was only 1K bytes of memory. So uh, get, getting back, let's continue on the Chrysler thing. So yeah, this took five years, right? Or four, four years to get this, get the, to get a productized product, you know, into Chrysler? No, actually. How many years? Did actually, it? only it took less than two years. Two years. When did you start? And when did I, I think it, you you we finally got to production in '79, right? Yeah, '79, '79, '80 is real production. We actually started in the early part of '78, uh, talking to them about the microprocessor based system. Uh, the first generation Lean Burn had been in production about two years, uh, and they were looking at, at doing an enhanced, either enhanced version of that or the microprocessor solution that we proposed to them. And so uh, it was kind of good timing. And, and we had the contacts. The key thing was we had contacts. We had contacts with Chrysler's electronics division. We had management contacts in Detroit. And so it was easy to talk to them about another generation of microprocessor. Uh, you know, he asked the question earlier, well, why didn't GM do this? Why didn't Ford do this? Well, we didn't quite have the same contacts within those companies either. Uh, didn't have the experience. Whereas we had the experience with the CMOS custom chip. And so there was a there's a comfort factor I think there with Chrysler and, and RCA, um, in, in, in a lot of different ways. <laughs> well, yeah. Also, if you go back and just get, get, go up a level, Chrysler was the innovator for the industry. Ford and GM lagged in terms of innovation. Chrysler mm -hmm. continued to all the new stuff, if you will, yep. came out with Chrysler cars during that period. So they were the guys that were going to change the industry. GM was a big, big fish, and they're not changing anything. They're making money, and by the way, this was one of the reasons Chrysler was losing money. Yeah. Right? They were out there with new technology quite often, making big investments. I was always curious, I don't know, uh, you know, curious about their whole acceptance criteria for this new technology, because that's a real high risk, mm -hmm. right? Imagine, I mean, at that period of time, making, you know, uh, spark advance and, you know, you, you basically, that software better work. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, the, the, it was, there was no fault tolerant system. They only had the one 1800 CPU. Yeah, yeah. So what I'm saying is, uh, uh, what, was their, what was their acceptance criteria? What did they put the, what kind of grueling uh, acceptance criteria did they put it through? Well, they, they did, uh, we, we supplied them plastic packages. They were not ceramic, they were actually in plastic. Um, and they had you know, acceptance quality criteria. They'd burn in and stuff like that. And, and uh, to my knowledge, they had really good results with our chips. They never, never really saw chip failures. Uh, most of the failures, as I recall, uh, were, were mechanical ones. Because uh, there was so much stuff on this board. And again, it's sitting on top of the engine. And so you think about that. And you've got a PC board and you've got lots of components besides the chips that are interconnected on this PC board. Uh, and it really only takes one solder connection to fail, to fail the system. And, and so I think most of the failures that they saw were, were of mechanical nature, not, not electronic nature, we've heard, uh, yeah, well. based on our parts. But the interesting thing about, about the Chrysler system, though, is that, again, the uh, advanced characteristics were stored in, in ROMs. And so the, the actual system that was the Chrysler system was, were two ROMs, uh, an off-board RAM, the 1802, and the custom I.O. chip. Uh, and so there were different ROMs for every engine transmission uh, rear end characteristic. So that, and every four cylinder, six cylinder, eight cylinder engine had its own ROM, every, every uh, different transmission had its own ROM, different cars with different load characteristics had different ROM codes. And so 
uh, we actually had to manage many, many, many ROM codes, uh, much like you would a, a supplying ROMs to a game manufacturer. You know, how many, you know, Zaxxon do you supply in any given month and that kind of thing. And so uh, we actually had dedicated marketing people that would actually track what Chrysler was shipping in order to make sure that uh, we were building the right mix of ROMs. Um, and and okay, just that's, that's that kind of a cross check. An interesting story to back, back you up in that. Um, when I was at RCA doing the marketing there, um, so I analyzed what was going on overall. And Chrysler was building about a million cars. And we were selling a, a million two. 1802s. Where the hell were the other 200,000 going to? Well, after investigation, I found that their module was so good that they ended off selling 200,000 modules to Volvo. So <laughs> there were two. Oh, that's a. I didn't so know that. Volvo was, uh, yeah. was Vol using? Volvo yeah. basically oh. had the Chrysler modules in their car, which had the 1802. And Chrysler was the distributor. <laughs> for us, they were, yeah, they were I mean, you know, manufactured, yeah. manufacturer sales. Yeah, yeah, they made a that. deal. I didn't either. That's uh, good. Good. That's cool. I was surprised as hell. Cause what the? Where are these? I said two hundred thousand going. <laughs> uh, okay, that was great. So it, yeah, go ahead. I was just to say the other interesting point is that in this exact same time frame, again we had built a Motronic system for Bosch that was also a full custom chip that had its issues and, and that kind of thing. It was much, much more programmable than the LeanBurn chip was. Um, and, and Bosch wanted to do a lot of things differently. And so we ended up selling them on a microprocessor-based solution as well. Uh, similar structure, ROMs, RAMs, uh, processor, and custom I.O. chip. Uh, and so in parallel with the, the Chrysler uh, design uh, challenges, shall we say, we designed a custom I.O. for Bosch. Uh, they required a little less support from, from Princeton Labs than Chrysler did. Uh, they had quite a significant group in, uh, in Schwebrieding outside of Stuttgart. Um, but we ver did a very similar thing with them, and that, that also went to production. Uh, and in fact, that shipped uh, fairly limited. I think it was only the six-cylinder BMWs that used the 1802-based uh, Motronic system. Um, but that ended up uh, being in production as well in the early, early 1980s, probably 1983 kind of time frame. Well, that kind of solidifies the quality because Bosch was yeah. at the top in terms of quality. Yeah. You know, about 10 years earlier than, you know, back in the 60s, yeah. uh, when I was doing real work as an engineer, uh, the, uh, <coughs> I had the responsibility to develop a bipolar, uh, bipolar anti-skid system for Bosch. And uh, you mentioned Stuttgart. They have a track there. Mm -hmm. And I remember uh, when we were signing this off, uh, they had built the module, the module was going into the car, and they, I, I was called to go to the track, and they, they basically uh, you know, had the anti-skid system uh, in the car, and they make one turn on the track, and the two people that were in the car get out of the car, and two other people go in, and uh, I said, uh, he, I said he, they said, well, we didn't have the uh, in a skid system enabled, and so we didn't do a test with that. So I wanted to make sure everything was was copacetic for the test. I said, "Well, why did you change drivers?" And he said, "Oh, they're not the drivers. They're the engineers that designed the system, you know. And they took it through the the Germans. You, you design an anti skid system, you drive that car, <laughs> you know. And uh, yeah. they basically." Uh, uh, the quality was always there, so I, yep. I'm sure with the Bosch 1800 was was really. Did you ever get to the track? Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. Did they do that kind of test or something like yeah, that? Yeah. I don't recall different different uh, driving teams necessarily, okay. but uh, yeah, they did. We did the track, and uh, which was kind of cool. I mean, uh, the Bosch system did a lot of stuff. I mean, it was it was really a real capable system. Um, but uh, what was I going to say about Bosch? The uh, Interesting thing about Bosch is that they were not on the engine. Uh, because since Bosch was a supplier to BMW, they weren't as integrated with, with the car manufacturing. And so their, their module actually mounted on the firewall. And so mechanically, it was a little more stable than uh, mounting on top of the engine. Uh, plus, at least to start production, they started actually in ceramic. Uh, 
I think they moved the plastic, as I recall, but uh, they actually started in yeah, ceramic. They were just, conservative. just to make sure. Yeah. Just yeah. to make sure on reliability. Yeah, they were. It was a big cost differential. Well, huge cost differential, but uh, they were more concerned with reliability and making sure that the initial ones, particularly the initial ones that they shipped, were, were never going to fail. You know, that kind of thing. Um, but there were two, two big design wins in under the hood applications for the 1802, which was clearly the first applications for a processor under the hood. And so that was, they were pretty good design wins. Well, you know, during that period uh, when I was the general manager, you know, I, I didn't have the key response. I had, I had the responsibilities basically to do kind of not so fun work. You had the fun, Nick. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. So uh, one of the not fun jobs was basically raising the capital because we were shipping, I think, a million units. See, Chrysler was putting this across most of their lines of cars. And, and so in Palm Beach Gardens, uh, we didn't have enough capital to, to do that, capital equipment to do that. So you had to raise significant capital equipment. Uh, and you had to get that approved through the RCA, Banquet Foods, Random House Books, you know, kind of capital committee. And uh, at about the same time, uh, the, the person who ran RCA for 19 years, uh, Bernie Von Schmidt, uh, was removed from his job. Okay, so, so you have RC, RCA kind of, and, and we're in between getting a new CEO, uh, who was Dr. Pepper, he wasn't there yet. But basically we have Ray Pollock, who uh, is running uh, the consumer division in Indianapolis and running semiconductors at the same time. That was Ray Pollock. We have no Bernie Von Schmidt. I always would go to New York with Bernie Von Schmidt. Okay, so, and he would be the calming figure because uh, he was recognized that, and you, you probably know this, but, you know, RCA in, obviously spent a lot of energy inventing color TV. And there was, that was, a, there was a war with CBS and different techniques to use. I won't go into all that detail, mm -hmm. but basically, Bernie Von Schmidt was key to color TV because he developed the vertical deflection systems for uh, the TV. He had over 36 patents. And before they assigned him to semiconductors to start, and I think they signed him to semiconductors, uh, he had only four people at w when, when he got that. Is Kalish, okay. He brought in Hesh Kajazita. <laughs> and, and there was myself, I remember Murray Polinsky. Uh, another another guy who was a process guy, but he grew that business. Anyhow, the the god who grew the, grew that business, who was sacred, is now gone, and he had tremendous influence on Princeton Labs. I would go down there, Princeton Labs. They treated him very respectfully, and in New York and Rockefeller Center, you know, he was the calming. And now I got Roy Pollock, who is, uh, let's see, how could I characterize him? He's very, he's emotional, okay. He is very articulate, very good speaker, okay. Uh, he's, you know, he, he appears to be a good leader. He only has one thing that is a big, big problem in that I, I thought he was kind of like a technology, he was weak in technology, let me put it that way. Very weak in understanding technology. And now uh, he is the guy I have to go to New York with and and basically, and, and he, he's a great financial guy. And I, let, me, let me put it another way. He doesn't really care about the technology if it's gonna generate cash. It's, what's, it's all about cash. So we go to New York and uh, we get the capital approved, but, um, but basically uh, they tell me I have to go down to Chrysler and get the money for the capital. And the capital is significant, you know. Uh, it's, it's like $26 million, and, I, and at that time, Chrysler's in a very precarious position financially. Uh, they're near bankruptcy. Lee Iacocca is depending on these new cars and, the, and these systems to really boost up sales. They had gone to the federal government and tried to get a $1.5 billion loan, that, and there was, it was great controversy. You know, they were in the news all the time uh, during that period. And now I have to go down there while they're on their backs and, 
and, and extract the capital uh, dollars. And that was quite a negotiation with them, and they're really ticked mm -hmm. off. And But th the bottom line was after uh, a period of time, which is delaying the program, uh, they agree, you know, to, s to actually send, send the dollars to our finance group, corporate finance group, and uh, I'm told that, you know, we're, we have approval, okay, at that time. And uh, so then I, I, I'm re one of my responsibilities as GM was Palm Beach Gardens. And so the plant manager, the guy by the name of uh, John Cooker, I, I just called him, I said, John, looks like, uh, you know, we got approval and start ordering the equipment, we got to get going, we're behind schedule. So, uh, you know, he said, okay, I'll get right on it. And I call him the next day and he says, ah, we don't uh, really, I'm, I'm not able to get the capital. He said, I can't get it released. And RCA had this bureaucratic system and he couldn't get the release to get the purchase orders. And I said, okay, it's the damn system. RCA is, you know, a slug with regard to cash coming out of it like that. And uh, next day I call him, he says, uh, I said, did you get, get approval, you get, get this thing ordered? He says, no. And then uh, it dawns on me uh, that you know, finance is not that happy. We got all this controversy about them going under any day. That's what's in the, and, and they have the money. And if they go under, we can keep the cash. So, <laughs> and, and it just so happens, Ray Pollock has two offices, one in Indianapolis and one in, in, in uh, Somerville. And he had, you know, he had moved Bernie out. So he had Bernie's office. He was, he was temporarily running the division. So I was able to go up to him and nicely explain to him that by the time, and there, there, there's a six, as you remember, there were six floors, Somerville. And he was, in this case, he was on the top floor. And I was on the third floor. I said, I'm going to walk down the stairs, I told him, to my office, and I'm going to call John Cooker again. And I said, if he tells me that the funds haven't been released, basically, I will call the New York Times and tell them, you know, we're going to take Chrysler out of, out of the business right now because, you know, they're not going to be able to make any cars, you know. And that's all I said. And Roy says, oh, you're, you're such an emotional guy, blah, 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 you know. And, uh, and uh, he and I went back many years, so I knew him well. He was a product marketing engineer when I was an engineering leader. So we'd go on a road together. And, so we knew each other, and then he rose to fame with all his great skills. Anyhow, by the long and short of it was by the time I got down there, I called Cooker and it was released. And we got the capital, uh, we were able to get the capital and launch, launch the business. Um, but you know, those are sort of the, the kinds of things that happen in big companies. And uh, I think they saw a windfall. You know, the corporate, corporate finance group saw a windfall here if, if they could go under. Uh, but the program took off, and uh, I left in 1980, you know, and came out to, came out to National. But the pro I think that program, you said successful, that program was very successful, okay, in terms of, yes. you know, uh, and it was very risky, and it was very successful, you know. Right. You, you hear Dick's frustrations at operation, and a little bit more on Pollock, well, later on, Later on, Pollock was on the national on uh, the RCA board of directors, and he was very significantly responsible for the sale of RCA to GE, which I don't think very many ex RCA people are in love with Pollock for doing that. Yeah, I want to talk more about that, but I think we ought to talk a little bit. Uh, we ha to me, I'd like to talk a little bit more about other applications. Yeah. Okay. A unless there's something else we want to add to Chrysler. Uh, I agree. You know, do you, we have well, the other interesting thing about Chrysler is yeah. that, so now we're in production with uh, 1802, the peripheral uh, high-yield chip. Uh, now Chrysler starts beating us up for price, of course. <laughs> and so we ended up having to do a shrink every single model year just to keep lowering the cost by just shrinking the chip further and further. And of course, as, as we got our new uh, projection printers, we had better capabilities so we could do finer geometries. And so uh, I think we ended up doing three shrinks, three years in a row of the 1802 and, and of the peripheral chip uh, in order to stay ahead of the cost curve, which is kind of an interesting challenge 
because at the time, my design group was also trying to do new processors looking forward, uh, both in the 1800 family as well as uh, in other families. And, and so uh, it was kind of a challenge to fit in all these cost reduction shrinks in addition to doing some of the new stuff we were trying to get done. Uh, and so, uh, but we did it, and, and we stayed ahead of the cost curve, and I think we made some money. Yeah, I think that was a profitable business, you know, very profitable business. So. But it, uh, so I guess to move to applications, I think one of the key things, you know, we talked earlier on about space and that kind of thing, and and so uh, again with the tech center itself, what the tech center did uh, was a guy by the name of Roger Stricker in, in the tech center, and uh, he along with Sandia Laboratories developed a rad hard version of the C squared L process. And so that was, uh, you know, really necessary for a lot of these space applications. And so uh, that was done in the, in the 1980-ish kind of time frame. And as uh, and so we started getting designed into, into space applications, again, we had a CMOS reputation. Uh, we had designed in other CMOS logic parts for some space applications. And, and so we were the first CMOS red hard processor available. And so we were natural for space applications. Uh, and so we started getting designed into a whole bunch of satellites. I mean, uh, dozens, if not hundreds of satellites uh, used the 1802 uh, over a, you know, about a 20 year period. Um, and, and so uh, that was, it was actually uh, an interesting kind of design win because none of these things are very high volume. I mean, I think the Galileo uh, spacecraft used 20 1802s which as far as I understand was probably the largest chip count. But again, there's only 20. Uh, and that went the furthest, right? That's yeah, the yeah. one that Can had, I had on, due to permit. On due Nick, okay, I'm gonna do this from my approach, which is more marketing and what we sold. So we're, as Nick said, we're selling roughly a million or so uh, 1802s, the Chrysler. We probably are selling another half million to so many customers that none of us can remember. And Galileo, because it's very popular, but there was military, there were just special industrial products, uh, military and aerospace. I mean, it, it, we did very well in Europe, okay? And so on. But it was still all small volume. Well, we are, we had a complete um, development tool group with the sof software people and hardware people and there were times we made more money on selling development tools than we did on the chips. Okay, so the development tool was not a bad business. You know, it, it added to the, some money into the bank and uh, of course for a company like Chrysler you give them the development tools. For the military and aerospace that are only ordering a, a much limited amount of processors, we sold development tools and they w were profitable. So uh, it developed a lot of customers, one big one and a lot of smaller customers. Yeah, we were actually uh, in a hard pacemaker, uh, believe it or not. And again, they, they wanted programmable capability. Uh, they actually Cordis designed this into a pacemaker, as well as the out-of-body pacemaker programmer to actually program the chip inside the body. Uh, designed into that too, the 1802. Uh, so lo lots of interesting applications. There are lots of it's a wide variety. I, I can comment on four that the RCA Labs developed that were pioneering because they didn't exist before. First one, of course, was Joe Weisbecker's dream always was to start seeing a programmable video game platform where you can insert ROM cartridges to change games. Up to that time, they were all hardwired, you know, and all that stuff. And that's how the Studio 2 was born. Um, and unfortunately, back to RCA management, um, a, year, a year or so later, and of course, Consumer electronics business was not impressed by video games, and so it was handled by the special products division that got us old cables and all that. A year later, Atari came out with a color version, and we had a color version running in the lab, but RCA senior management in New York said, well, video games are a fad. So they killed that. Anyway, 
Um, didn't make Joe happy, but uh, my group was pioneering sort of new things. And one big issue in those days, RCA had a big business called Global Communications. And the standards in terms of the format for paper tape being sent back and forth and the, and the transfer rate were different for the US and for Europe. So a typical messaging was done by this paper tape comes in, piles up on the floor, which is different code and different speed than the US standard. Then that would be right into another machine, which would create a paper tape compatible with the US standard. And that's finally sent to the machine to transmit it. And uh, so, so we developed the first uh, microprocessor based controller, which would basically, and one of the early floppy disks, which would grab the message coming in, no paper tape, buffer it in a floppy disk, and then be the buffer and the time, and then create the other format and ship it off. And that won an award in the early 70s at, in, um, um, what the hell was it? Anyway, it won a big award at this big show, the first microprocessor controlled um, communication transport system. And then also in those days, RCA Labs, consumer electronics got so much attention, RCA Labs was told, hey, if you can find some project that'll help CE, consumer electronics, it'd be approved. So one of our guys said, gee, why can't we apply microprocessors to factory automation? So he went out to Indianapolis and Bloomington to look around and they found that they were having big, is big issues in both quality and cost of calibrating these coils that would converge the RGB colors. And because the poor woman there had to, con there are three screws to be adjusted, and, and she had to go back and forth and adjust them all uh, until everything looked okay. So we developed a machine using the Cosmac box that would have three screwdrivers and really quickly iterate and converge them. So better quality and much lower cost. And that was deployed in, in Bloomington. And now the video camera business that made the high-end broadcast cameras had the same issue. They had a setup issue when they first put a camera at a football game or some event, it would take a technician half hour, an hour to adjust everything. So again, we developed a microprocessor controlled calibration that would do it in a few minutes automatically. And um, so I'm trying to think, was, was there anything else? No, I think, I think those were the kind of things that were at that time in, in the world were very pioneering, because no one else had done them. And I remember Pollock one time, I didn't know him very well, but one time I was on a plane to Indianapolis with him, and he said, this guy Russo is trying to put microprocessors everywhere. Well, <laughs> I feel vindicated. Um, yeah, he said it as a negative, though. I said, oh, yeah, he sure did. <laughs> okay, he sure I, I'm going to <laughs> say, say something, because we got to get to the real life, okay, marketing world for the 1802. The 1802 could not compete in price price point with NMOS processes, okay? We were looking for applications that CMOS would give us a, an advantage. Now, Paul is talking about every one of the applications Paul just talked about, there is no real CMOS advantage. And therefore, we have almost zero sales in those areas, okay? But we uh, showed that that can be done. Yes. RCA Labs what was not a division of RCA Solid State. It was separate. And it had a uh, background to develop products which RCA could produce outside of Solid State. Hmm. In fact, let me add to that. I can just add to this measurement issue. My group actually developed a home computer in 1979 one year before the IBM PC. We had Bill Gates there for a whole day, just a young 22-year-old kid. He had just started Microsoft. We're gonna use the Intel 8080 because we needed more horsepower than, uh, than the RCA processor at that time. Had all this working software called HEIC, Home Entertainment and Information Center. The big boys from New York come down, and like I said earlier, and said, we can't sell this like TVs. And that's when I, I was so frustrated seeing all these things killed that I took off to GE at that time. Again, I think the senior management lacked the vision to see video games and all computers all being potential huge businesses. You know, you, you kind of summarize uh, the apps. Uh, you know, what, what, you, what you were saying is that um, 
you know, because of, you know, the efficient architecture code was easy to write, the power we talked about, you could suspend the, the CPU. It was fast, it was C squared L, and it was, it was fast for CMOS. So the two markets were, you know, space and, and automotive. Those were, and the noise immunity that you mentioned earlier. Okay. That was a big one. Yeah, yeah, that, what I'm saying is, so in these two markets, uh, RCA was a leader in those two particular markets. Uh, I'd like to go back to the space because uh, in the space area, uh, you, you mentioned a number of them. I think the OSCO was the number one. That was the first one out in space. Uh, and, uh, but uh, the 1802, as you talked about, was in Galileo. And Galileo, uh, actually was launched in 86, I think, probably? 84. 84, okay. And I think it went, and it, it, it went, it was supposed to go for four or five years, and it went until 2004, okay, almost almost 20 years, okay. Uh, so, so basically... Uh, almost 30. Uh, 2004 from 84, yeah. Well, uh, 94, no, two, two, uh, 20, 20. Yeah, 84 is... Oh, 84, 30, yeah. 30, yeah. So, uh, and it, it actually made, uh, it, it went 2.3 billion miles to Jupiter and finished its mission. That's what oh, it did. Yeah. That, that's what it did. And, and then the other one, I guess, is the Hubble telescope. That, to me, is amazing. Because it, it's up, it's still up, cranking, and... Uh, and, uh, and that's 27 years, you know, I think. That's got the 1802 in it? Yeah. 18. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah. The Hubble? Yeah. Awesome. So. Really awesome. So the, that's probably, you know, kind of, yeah, you, you look at where RCA is a leader, it's a leader, it's a leader for a long time. <laughs> it's a leader post, it's a little bit like a Unix operating system when you get a bug and you're going to die. This bug happened in 1985, but you know, the applications <laughs> still keep going, mm -hmm. you know, for, for RCA's 1802 yeah. family. So I think that's to quite amazing. To continue on where Dick leaves off there, yes, the RCA 1802 had a phenomenal long life. I mean, really phenomenally long. Surprised me when I researched it. And uh, it was in a lot of, what do you say, military applications, and I always said, it was hard to get designed into military, hard to get, equally hard to get designed out. <laughs> okay, so, uh, okay, dear to you, Steve, I have here, and I'd like to put it into the record, the first page of an 1802 data sheet by Intel, and I want you people to key on Intercell. 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 That would have been key in. on <laughs> the. <laughs> let's let's change it to Intel. <laughs> <laughs> eh, not a bad idea. <laughs> okay, uh, but a key on the date here. You're deflecting me. October seventeenth, two thousand and eight. That's the data sheet for an eighteen oh two eight bit processor. And then the other thing to key on is why they did it for use in aerospace, military, and critical industrial equipment. A high cost processor, they were continuing that design in for the military. But this is now, we're talking about 2008. I mean, it obeys the heck, heck out of me, okay? Um, and so I want to put this into the record. The 1802 was produced in 2008 at least by Intercell, probably went on for a number of years after that. Um, and I don't think we mentioned the morph of RCA Semiconductor. RCA Semiconductor, RCA was bought by GE. GE splits off the semiconductor operation by putting in GE Semiconductor, which is a much smaller operation, merges it with RCA, sells it to Harris. And then Harris is bought by Intercell. So that's why Intercell was producing the device. Interesting. Really, really interesting. So let me just summarize this session. And so we have this product, the 1802. 
and it has these characteristics that we talked about, power, speed, C squared L speed, uh, low power, suspendability, uh, clean, clean, simple architecture you code easily. Um, and we have a, a leadership position in space, a leadership position in engine control electronics or automobiles. Let's move on uh, 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 to what could we summarize the contributions the 1802 microprocessor family made to the industry? You know, let's talk about, you know, what, what's so important about this? What, what did we do for the industry? Okay. Started CMOS microprocessors, which by 1985, everything was CMOS microprocessors. And I think that's a very good point. And there, but it, it actually, uh, I would say it started in the 80s, you know, in the early 80s. Okay. Oh, the, the, this thing started I'm, in No, the I'm early talking, 70s. talking about the conversion to CMOS by the Intels of the world. Okay. I know when I came to National in 1980, everybody viewed uh, CMOS as a boutique technology for all the reasons we talked about, okay? It was good for all the reasons. Uh, within a few years, and we, we never designed in, at National. I came there and we designed always in CMOS. That's what we designed, okay? And, and the reason we did that is you couldn't get the density you wanted on the chips and the right power on the, particularly if you're, if you're eventually gonna have programmable CPUs that include uh, demand page virtual memory and, and interrupt controllers and, and floating point, the rest of this. So, so basically, I, and I think RCA kind of led that revolution in that they, as you said, developed that technology and the world started to change. That was a big, big issue, uh, I think. Okay, to go along with that, a lot of things is, let's say, in about 85, uh, Intel comes out with the 386. The game is over. It's all CMOS from there on in. Okay. There's, there's remnants of NMOS, but the, the world basically went to CMOS microprocessors. RCA started this going in the early 70s, and I think that's a great contribution. Is there anything else we can? Well, I think yeah, I think that was the main thing. I think demonstrating the fact that, that CMOS could actually run under the hood and control engines was a pretty big deal. I mean, at that time, nobody had thought about yeah. or would attempt to do that in, in any sort of NMOS capability. So, uh, I think that was that proved to the world that, that this was a so just think this was a, a big deal. If RCA had not pushed CMOS, if there was no RCA. In, uh, Somerville that pushed CMOS. Were, would this transition were, would have happened when it did in the 80s or would it have taken decades more for people to figure out this whole new technology? It would have happened. S uh, yeah, so, so I think RCA was a pioneering entity in technology in the 70s in many, many respects. Well, RCA is one of the companies that has a not invented here approach. And basically CMOS was mostly invented and developed at RCA. So it was their thing and they pushed it beautifully. Okay, so we, we got all this good stuff we contributed to the industry. So why weren't we more successful? Let's talk about that a little bit. Well, I think, uh, I think one thing that, that uh, I could, needed to be done I've got a lot. Of one of the things I want to say is, is I want to say something on that one right away, but I want to start. There was more fingerprints on the birth of the 1802 than I've ever seen on any <laughs> anything. I mean, just think of how many people worked at RCA Labs, and fortunately, it was because of the demise of the computer systems division opened up a lot of people at RCA Labs. Now, if, it, if RCA Labs was a commercial division, they were laid off. But RC Lab doesn't lay off. <laughs> so the, all these excess people, we benefited at RCA Solid State. Okay, the second thing is, go along that same line, is you gotta remember, I was at Motorola before I came, returned to RCA. 
and I saw the Motorola operation on the 6800, which came out to be the 68000 later on. It was a much more efficient operation. We had all our design, all our uh, marketing, all the things, all in a brand new operation in Austin, Texas. And there was only two groups in Austin, Texas, the CMOS group and the um, microprocessor group. But these groups operated much more efficiently. I mean, the fab was right there. Everybody talked to one another. I mean, I, I, I see the difficulties that Dick had. I'm saying those difficulties did not exist at Motorola, much less. And that's one of the reasons RCA was not as successful. Let me, let me add some color to that, because uh, there's a fact that probably most people don't know. Two facts. One is that in the 70s, the patent revenue for RCA was humongous, because they invented color TV, the tubes, the standards for transmission. And they generated the most cash per year yeah, than any and, generation. And in fact, that money flowed into labs and the execs flowed back into, into the corporate. So the RCA labs with its 1,500 people was actually not costing cash out from the corporation. It was bringing cash in because of all the massive patents that they owned for color TV, which, which caught fire. Now, why uh, Welch did what he did? In, in 1980, I joined GE. And I used to go to his annual meetings, you know, where the last day he gives his religious speech. And one of his religious speeches that Welch did was, we're not going to be in anything that the guys in Asia are in, because even though you can win through investment, it's going to be a lower margin, and therefore it's going to hurt our stock price, because his goal was to make GE the world's most valuable company, which he succeeded in doing, actually. So there goes small appliances, there goes television, there goes semiconductor. He wanted to get rid of all that stuff where GE could not have a huge advantage, things that took a decade to develop, whether it's medical devices, jet engines, broadcast, turbines, especially plastics, those kind of things. And as soon as they bought RCA, since I had been there, I knew that all those businesses were going to be gone. He had no desire. It points really to the fact that the senior, the CEO of a company, whether it was RCA, with its perhaps lack of vision, and Walsh had a very focused strategy that didn't involve the things that people in Asia were focused on. Th that changed history. If you had different CEOs there, you had, had very different outcomes. So yeah. answer yeah, the I, question. I think the, I think the lack of vision, I think, is a key thing, because uh, one of the limitations in 1802 was that it had no memory on board. And so you always had to have external ROM, one or more external ROMs, sometimes external RAM, in addition to whatever uh, peripheral interfaces you needed. And, and so uh, the if you had competition at the time were single chip microcomputers okay. with onboard ROM, enough onboard RAM, that kind of thing. So we defined. Board, Dick, you call it Dick, a calm, calm down. Yeah. So at the time, we actually defined what we called an 1804, which was an 1802 with 2K of ROM on board, with 64 <laughs> bytes of RAM, <laughs> and with an enhanced instruction set that would do things. Uh, that our customers wanted to do. Uh, we had an onboard timer counter. Uh, we improved the DMA capability. We had BCD arithmetic uh, and a number of other instruction set improvements. Uh, and so we defined this 1804 and actually built it uh, in SOS. Now in the late 70s, early 80s, SOS was the future technology choice for RCA. Uh, and that was also driven by the labs, unfortunately because it turned out it was not the future. And so in the early 80s, uh, RCA made a decision to get out of the SOS business. Uh, unfortunately, we had designed a number of chips in SOS, the 1804 included. Uh, and so now we did not have a next generation 1800 series. And so we had to initiate a design of an 1804 in a bulk CMOS process. Uh, and at the time, that's when uh, isoplanar processes started being developed. And, and that was really the process state of the art. And so we actually had to develop a, what we call CMOS-1, which is an oxide isolated CMOS process in which we would design the 1804 again in that process. Uh, and quite a bit different than the SOS process because the design techniques used for SOS were quite a bit different than, than bulk CMOS. Um, unfortunately, uh, 
RCA in the mid 80s time frame uh, began winding down any new development in, in processors and memories and, and basically in the division, the solid state division. And so uh, a lot of uh, what we thought were pretty good projects. We had RAM projects going on that were, we did 16K static RAM. We were looking at E squared problems in combination with the Princeton Labs. We were looking at the 1804 as well as the 16 bit version of the 1800 series. All these projects were not approved by the division. So it was, it was kind of a sit back and, and kind of milk it for a while. And, you know, at that point, uh, you know, I was frustrated, and so I left uh, RCA, and, and so as did a number of other really good people just prior to the GE acquisition and yeah. the wind down, if you will, of, of the capability. And so, you know, the limitation, I think, for the 1800 series was, in fact, the lack of management vision. I, I mean, upper management vision. Uh, not people at my level or, or Dick's level, but it was the people beyond that that, that didn't have the vision for what processors or, or, for that matter, any CMOS products, I mean, it would look like going forward. Uh, and so that's really what what ended the life of, of the 1800 series in terms of ongoing enhancements and, and stuff like that. Yeah, I, you know, I, I, c I can add to that. I would say that uh, my view, if I get up just a little higher level, uh, when uh, in 1971, when you know Weisbecker invented his his product, his 1800 series, um, RCA was the Apple or Google of its era. They were the largest consumer company and the the most technically competent. It was run by David Sarnoff, who sort of founded it and ran it, and he was it was all about technology, uh, you know, and, and bringing technology the best technology, and that's why they set up the he, he, the Princeton Labs was his baby. Yeah, it was called okay. David Sarnoff for yeah. sure. Yeah. Oh yeah, I think after he died, but basically in 71, he was alive, and I would say, the com <laughs> I know the company when I was there in 71 was, I, I call it inoculated with the, his energy and his vision. He would come around, he would be looking at technology, and and, and you knew that you were, you were a leader, okay, when he was done. Unfortunately, he died in December of 71, and his son, Robert, took over. And Robert immediately, he was sort of a gadfly, okay, Robert, like many sons, <laughs> okay, <laughs> important people. But, uh, but basically, he, uh, he was into the latest running of big businesses, and that was diversification in the 70s. Conglomerate. You got to have a conglomerate, you got to diversify. And he focused the electronics, he wasn't really interested in new technology, even though he kept the, the labs. And the labs kept churning, but his focus was, as you said earlier, uh, the licensing group, which was the most profitable group in the company, but they're the ones that licensed, and the licensing was not just patents, I know because we had to, in the semiconductor group, provide assistance to people, you know, like, uh, oh, I mean, the Japanese manufacturers, mm. uh, it, you know, Sony. We Sony, we gave Sony everything and we helped them get into the TV market. Audio, you know, radio, all of that was licensed away and, and, and that, that was number one. Number two, he was focused on NBC. NBC generated a lot of cash, okay? It was and, profitable. And number three, because of his, and I, you know, I, I don't say the gadfly, but he was, he was in the news a lot with different, he was, he was focused on um, RCA Victor Records, vinyl records at that time, and Columbia Vinyl Records, and you'd see him in the news with all these singing artists, you know what I mean? So those was his... They that were was, Playboy. They, yeah, that, those were the three. And, and no risk. And meanwhile, the labs, the labs, because I, I, I would go down there regularly with Bernie Von der Schmidt uh, to look at the technology down there. And I still remember, I mean, looking in the, the 70s, LC, LCDs were developed. They had flat panel TVs developed. Oh, I mean, yeah. you know, it was it was all developed in the early seventies, yeah. and and they would the labs would show and Bernie would try to go to New York with it and they would squelch it. Okay, yeah, they would say you plasma know, displays and yeah, 70s. you know, 
Mm -hmm. So basically, t to me, uh, Robert Sarnoff, the, the whole company took a different twist during the period of 70, when he took over in 72 uh, to 1985 when we finally sold it to GE, I guess the company. Uh, but to me, that was a, a tectonic shift, okay, in terms of, it was the root cause of all the other issues that we saw, and that you right. name, that you name, that you name. I mean, yep. this was the root cause. Right. The company's DNA was changed, you know. We had a DNA to, and, and at the top, at the top, because he diversified. And what, what value does, you know, an executive on the board of Banquet Foods add to what we're doing? Or Cornet Carpets, right. or, Hertz, you know, yeah. Hertz, or books. Yeah. This was really, I think, the big issue at RCA. And the bureaucracy got to me. I, I left in 1980 primarily because Bernie was gone, and I really didn't like what I had to go through with, with, with. Uh, that same year I left. Poly, you know, and and, yeah. and so that was that was my end at, at that, that that period of time. But you know, all of us here worked during the period. I think it's kind of interesting. Um, we all we all came out Silicon Valley, including Bernie von Schmidt. And Bernie von Schmidt, at the age of 61 started Xilinx. I mean, probably the most successful FPGA company in the world, you yes. know. And, and so you had all this talent coming out here and, uh, and, and many more engineers that I don't, I don't even know right now that, that came out. Your, your boss for a while, Alex, Alex Young, and, and, and I think, uh, uh, you know, I'd like to just take a moment to talk about, you know, uh, so what, what contribution did you deliver out here that you're kind of proud of, Nick, uh, you know, in your, your years out here? Well, I think, uh, you know, a number of things. I think uh, I had a lot of experience in custom chips at, at RCA and, and, and frustrated with doing manual custom chips. And so uh, when I joined VLSI, we really drove very, very hard custom chip capabilities, both from a design standpoint, a tool standpoint, as well as manufacturing and by having technology centers in customer locations. Uh, I think that was an important thing to actually bring the tools to the customers and the design expertise. Because we had designers in our tech centers. We didn't just have applications people. And I think that, that was pretty important. But, but I look at the rest of my jobs too. And, and you know, a lot of the VPGM jobs I, I did were uh, turnaround type jobs. Companies had problems. In the case of Xilinx, they were acquiring a PLD company. They needed somebody to run it and bring, bring it inside of Xilinx. In the case of IDT, we had microprocessor problems that needed fixing, and, and so I, I did a lot there. And, and so uh, I did a number of things that were, were you know, turnaround type situations, uh, product improvement situations, that kind of thing. And, and uh, you know, and a lot of the experience was at good old RCA, you know, good old RCA training camp. Uh, and I think that's true of a lot of people out here in the Valley. Uh, there was a lot of people that got, got trained by RCA back in New Jersey and, and, yeah. and have brought that expertise okay. out here. My comment, I'll make an analogy to a football team. RCA had too many interceptions and fumbles. And that cost them, and it cost them from being a leader. The second observation is no present semiconductor company okay, has a central research lab. That wasn't the methodology with, within the semiconductor industry. We see that in Silicon Valley, but we also see that in TI and Motorola. There was no s central research laboratory. Intel has. Hmm? Intel has a central. They have a central. Mm. Yeah, Sarnoff yeah. was 1,500 people. It was massive. Yes, and Sarnoff still exists. It was not RCA, but it still exists. Um, yes, and of course, all patents became the central property of RCA. Okay, and there was a business model for that. Okay, more than Pullman, because. When I, I joined RCA, I joined the group that was in that business. 
It was called the Industry Service Lab. They had a group in Princeton, a group in New York City, and they administrated all the patents. And they got, and the process was not only to get revenue from royalty, but you also gave away designs to get back more royalty. So you got a lot more royalty by helping people in, in the industry. And it was a very concentrated thing because I remember in Somerville, uh, where the solid state was, they had to have a group there that supported the industry. But that group had to be somewhat away from the mainstream, okay, because there was a conflict of interest. For instance, in the television, it was very obvious. RCA was the leading television manufacturer. But the industry service lab serviced all the other television manufacturers, main, not as much Zenith, but all the little lesser ones. And they would almost give them a design, but they had to pay royalties. So do you think that was a net plus or a minus? It was definitely a net plus from that group standpoint. <laughs> no, they I'm talking minus. about Overall, to RCA. Minus. Yeah. Absolute minus. Uh, I don't think it was a real minus because, you know, if, when you got the football, you got to run with it. Okay? You, you don't think it's a minus to take this technology you spent hundreds of millions of dollars and over many years and, gr and give it, okay, to with Sony. these licenses? You were, you were, we were charging for it. Yeah, but, <laughs> but we had Akio Morita, who died recently, was the chairman of Sony. At that time, he was director of R&D for Sony Labs, I think sometime in the late 70s. And he came through Sarnoff. At that time, RCA was, I mean, um, Sony was making these little Trinitron TVs. We showed him everything, everything. And that was part of the strategy about licensing yes. anything. Sony it, it killed the was a licensee or they wouldn't have let him into RCA Labs. Well, this might have been part of the, some of other licensing yes. problems, maybe not for CMOS, but I mean, because they were showing everything and then it let these guys accelerate. And then uh, there was another event in the 70s where RCA Labs had a layoff and laid off about 200 people that were involved with the TV business and Samsung established an R&D lab in Princeton. <coughs> hired all those people and you know their job was kind of to explain what they're doing and ship it off to Korea and two or three years later they shut down the Samsung Princeton lab and three years later out comes the first Samsung color TV so um, there was not a lot of care about the fact because RCA was a leader and had, you know you look at the apples and other companies here they were main leaders uh, there was very little focus on it was more how do you just I, 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 would, I would be even more harsh. RCA squandered their yes. technology with those licensing groups. Yes. They squandered it. I agree with that. Okay. Uh, you know, even on the, the, I'll give you an idea, even on the royalty side, where, uh, I'll, I'll give you an example. When, uh, I, when I was a young engineer at RCA, I had, uh, I had the responsibility for Delco, and I was designing uh, radio circuits at that time for Delco, okay? And so I'm designing these circuits and you use, uh, in addition to your own IP that you're designing, you can remember they're tube guys. So, you know, if, oh, just yeah. to give you one example, if you want to de develop an IC with an AGC characteristic, their engineer, we, you know, I kept asking where I couldn't get it, I couldn't get it, and finally, he, one day he says, okay, I can give you the AGC characteristic, okay? And he pulls this out of this drawer and it's, it's dusty and it's like yellow paper, okay? And the AGC characteristics on it, in the corner it says 1936 Oldsmobile, okay? And, and I'm going, wow, <laughs> this is what you're dealing with. Okay, so you're, you're designing, you get the, I, the chip and the audio uh, design in, and it happened to be a, a Murphy packet, patent that I used for the a direct couple audio that RCA had developed, and I put that in. So they're shipping radios. Down comes the licensing group from New York, comes to see me and says, gee, you did a really good job. You got 
this, you got your circuit in, and you know you use the Murphy patent for the audio amplifier. And I said, yeah, that, you know, that's a big customer. We're, 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 we're talking about all GM cars. He says, well, we're going to sue them. And I said, you're going to sue Delco? We just did this, you know? And I go to, go to Bernie, <laughs> Bernie, help me, you know? <laughs> They're going to sue Delco. And Bernie goes, I don't think I can help you, Dick, because they were totally in independent. And they came, and it was at that time the largest suit against General Motors. I was persona non grata there for four years. Okay. That's the, that's the penalty of that oper of that type of operation, and but but is that good for business? That's not good for business. Later on, it became more sensitive to that. I mean, they it's a whole more sensitive, but uh, yes, the New York guys were pretty brutal. It was insane to I have a. a, a, a <laughs> it was it was just crazy. I mean, but that to me, it goes. It always starts at ruts at the top, right? The fish had ruts at the top, and that's. Sarnoff is running it, and he's getting the cash, and he doesn't care about the technology, okay? And that's, that's what I read yeah. in all yeah. of that. Uh, at, when you're at your level, when designing something, and they're basically taking your creativity uh, and crushing it, yeah. Oh, they didn't think anything of it. They, they were know. trying to explain to me that I know. everybody does this. I go, no, everybody doesn't the, do on this. On the other side, <laughs> Paul, that paid for your salary for a number of years because RCA Labs got its paid, okay, got its money from patents and government contracts, mostly patents. All the royalties paid for RCA Labs. But Dick, because we didn't commercialize the technology they were developing, we didn't commercialize it. No, nope. you know, you so you opportunities. Yeah. Well. Video games, personal computers, LCD okay, screens, no. everything. They, they could have been the leader. There's a lot of things that were not commercialized, Marche Labs, and a lot of, let's say, the RCA did a lot of fumbles that way. But things like TV, they did commercialize, okay? Not LCD? They could no. Think about mm -hmm. where they could be today in LCD. They were too far front in LCD. You or know, plasma. You know the story plasma of plasma in the 70s. If you're too far in front, well, they gave up on LCD look, way before. Look what started. Samsung is doing yes. with OLEDs today. Yes. They own OLEDs. Yes. They're going to make more money out of the iPhone 10 than Apple. Okay? That's what they're going to do. I mean, that was, that was the position that RCA was in. You know, with their technology. RCA but had lots of good positions they didn't follow through on. But then they had good positions they did follow through on. Okay. <coughs> RCA developed a top notch military business. And if you read the articles on GE, you mentioned well, why GE bought RCA for two reasons. GE bought it for their military business, which was a mistake because the military business went downhill for everybody. And the other one was NBC. NBC, correct. Yeah, I, I believe Those two that things they I wanted. Believe the, the rest they didn't give about. But just to show you the lack, lack of vision, so before the, the big executives in New York in 1979 kiboshed the RCA Labs developed home computer, we're actually recruiting a guy from California, I forgot what, Stanford or Berkeley, and he had a job offer from Apple and from RCA. And we said, Apple? RCA is going to crush them. Well, he had good judgment. He went to Apple. Because <laughs> <laughs> yeah. six months later, they killed the project at RCA. Okay, we have to go back to Dick again. I got a couple of things. One of the things is the Sarnoff comments you made it were, t were totally correct. RCA l lost its visionary, lost its visionary leader. It was like having a great coach and then having crappy coaches like the 49ers have done, uh, okay. Sarnef was a leader, okay. He was the one that stole RCA from the rest of the industry. And that was based on patents because GE, okay, and you're going to remember this, GE and Westinghouse and there's a few others formed RCA and gave it all the electronic patents for like a number of years, okay? 
That's Sarnoff. That's his vision. He made RCA, okay? And he was a visionary, and when they lost him and his son, there was the, the, the RCA lost its vision to take stuff from RCA Lab and start a new business. And if it wasn't the PC, why did they do the games, or why they didn't do this and that? They, 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 the batting average went real low. Yeah. Uh, the other comment was, uh, <coughs> as Nick said, SOS. Well, St. Queenie, Dick, you blew <coughs> up SOS, and I was your cheering section. Well, you know, yeah, I blew up SOS. It was the right uh, First move. of all, I didn't blow it, but it was blowing up, and I was there when it was blowing well, up. But well, let me tell you how I felt about it. Uh, you cannot, uh, the problem we have with SOS is that it, not the technology itself. It was the fact that you couldn't compete wafer-wise with bulk CMOS. They were just, it cost $16 at that time to do an SOS. And we made the ribbon. We made the ribbon in Lancaster. Mm -hmm. And so our SOS substrates were 16 bucks and four bucks for a bulk CMOS substrate. You can't make a, and the, and the rest of the industry is working on bulk CMOS and you have a small group in Princeton, which is small compared to the whole industry developing bulk CMOS technology. But one thing I learned from that exercise, you don't go in alone on technology if you're a company. I don't care how good your technology is, you have to have the industry with you. Okay. You can't come in with these uh, very, look at all the companies that have fields with specialty kind of uh, 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 processes. Along that line, I saw the frustration which matches. Uh, do you remember what happened and really killed SOS was we were on three inch wafers. We had to go to four on the, on the, on the SRAM. There were no four inch wafers and we'd have to go it alone. And I think that was one of the Well, the going it alone was the problem. Yeah. That was the problem that you had with Sapphire. And I'm just trying to emphasize that that was the case that we were a loner in the industry on that process. Yeah, I think that's, you know, I, I think there are the vision issues, which are the big issues, the individual, and that kind of filters down into the top management, the bureaucracy of a diverse, a uh, conglomerate, if you will. Uh, I always look <coughs> at, you look at successful companies like uh, Intel, they they were one product, then then maybe two, right? Okay, it was memory and first memory, then micros, okay, and two product. Everybody in the company knew what 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 the vision was, okay, and what they had to do. Uh, and Andy Grove in his book talks about you know when they went from memory to micro, and yeah. you know uh, I think he said with Gordon Moore he was sitting there and said basically. Uh, what would we do if we were two new CEOs? You know, we would fire us, okay, and probably come in and focus on microprocessors. And that's what they did. They did. They did that. Yeah, uh, in the late 80s, no, late uh, 90s, I was doing uh, intellectual property stuff uh, for National. <laughs> and, uh, I got some numbers. National had. 10,000 different dye, okay, and that means generic dye. How many did Intel have? The process, <laughs> I, you probably count them on, on hands and toes to the amount of different product dye they had. It was an amazing difference, but that was the analog business of all these little <laughs> chips of different ones. Okay, we kind of, I just want to, because, uh, you know, I had asked what you, he, Nick told about his contribution to the industry. You, you talked about what what specific contribution are you most proud of that you made to the industry? Well, there's one I'm working on right now. I think I talked to you guys about, and I am the IEEE milestone coordinator for Santa Clara Valley section, and we've got a big double header milestone coming up next May. 
and the two milestones there are the birthplace of Silicon Valley, which is Shockley Labs, now Shockley screwed up, and uh, Moore's Law, which was very successful. So we're doing those two together, and I'm right now in the middle of that. <laughs> and it's, it may be my last big push, but I'm really, I'm really proud how well it's going. And, and this is ties in with the muse with the uh, Computer History Museum. They will be doing a big evening event on it with a panel. We hope to get Gordon Moore. To, okay, if Gordon's in decent health shape. Okay, and uh, I'm sort of sort of it's it's like my going out. I'm 86 and <laughs> I'm getting a little old. Now you young. Yeah. <laughs> okay, Paul. How about talking you about RCA? No, talking about you. You Me. came out here, and you're a serial entrepreneur. I'm yeah. really asking, what are you, what are, what were you the most? The proud two, of? Uh, I guess the two or three highlights. Um, one was as soon as Weisbecker raised the idea, I got it right away and said, "This is it," and and put all myself through that whole space of microprocessors, uh, and then. Uh, when I left GE in 86 to start Genesis Microchip, uh, what the VCs accused me of, probably correctly, that I tend to be very good at guessing what the future is going to be, but I tend to be always a bit early. So we started developing scaling technology, had trouble raising money like any chip business in, in, in the late 80s. But then we saw flat panel displays coming, and we had the best scaling technology. And uh, remember, they were $1,500 for a little display. And, uh, and we were arguing with the graphics guys because they said, why do you need a scale of the monitor? Where the graphics guys will render it. And we said, no, they have to have smarts in the display to make it look good, optimize it. And all the LCD makers were saying, ah, oh, your chip's too expensive. And then Apple put us in their first flat pound monitor. Within 18 months, we had 80% worldwide share. Yeah, that was a huge success. And, and, huge and, uh, success. The, and then the other thing that, in retrospect, I'm proud of, although I question my own judgment sometime in 08 when the second company blew up, that had geometric processing. No one had the vision, because we were selling a few to the military guys for head-up displays and stuff, distortion correction, because we can do it with no latency. And Qualcomm that bought the commodity business in Silicon Optics for 60 million, could have paid two million bucks more to get all the geometric processing technology. It didn't. So we acquired that for less than two million dollars. Patents, inventory, customers, and now we're gonna be in every car going forward to start shipping because now, not only for the camera and, and giving different views and then warping and all that, but also on the factory floor, with our technology you can do auto calibration. He's only got the screwdrivers to, to take care of the manufacturing stuff. And now, when I started talking about that five, six years ago, every, no one knew what AutoCal meant. Now, all our customers want auto calibration because it's saving money on the factory floor. No people. Sure, sure. And, it's uh, a big deal. And the same kind of thing with the same boys. Like, we argue with the graphics guys at Genesis. Now, we were arguing five years ago with the NVIDIAs of the world. We said we're going to do everything in our main computer. We said, no, you got to have smarts on the edge. Because if you've got seven, eight cameras, how is the big computer going to process everything in real time? And if you have a mirror you want to replace with a camera, that's the speed of light. You can't have any latency. And if you, so, so our geometric processing is actually a parallel engine that you can program to do trillions of transforms, but it acts like a scalar. It does it in one sixth of a second. Mm. And so we're dominating automotive now, but no one saw that. So. But it was tough because I guess we're probably a bit early. <laughs> and 08 and 09 were not the best years to raise money for a chip company. But those are probably the, the three things that I think in hi hindsight I feel, I feel good about. I'll talk a little bit about myself. Uh, the uh, thing I feel pretty good about at National, we came very close, but we didn't get the brass ring. <laughs> okay, C coming close in that uh, the, th 32,000 family, and really we had first 32 bits out in, in the world at that time. Uh, it took us a long while t to actually get the, we had to design our, des our design tools, our simulations, all of that had to be done uh, 
all our tools had to be done in concert with the designers and we had our own tool group and we would take six seven eight revs to get a product out it was terrible by 1984 we had all our tools in place and we got a product out that was called the 532 uh, 32,532 which came out ran Unix on the first chip and we had been working with Burroughs, uh, Burroughs uh, Rancho Bernardo and Colorado Springs designing in all of the 32,000s it was a two-year design in cycle and I thought this was going to be it. The 386 wasn't out yet, and Intel was really slow, and they really had uh, 286, which wasn't really, uh, it, it really was, it, it was lame. I guess that's all I could say. The, uh, so we had this thing all wrapped up. We thought we'd get Burroughs and start turning the industry because there wasn't any 32-bit out. And National Semiconductor didn't really have we had relationships with, as I said, Rancho Bernardo and Colorado Springs. But in Detroit, that's where all the power was. And the power, there was uh, the CE, the chairman was uh, a guy by the name of Blumenfeld. I'll never forget these guys' names. I'm going to the grave with this. Blumenfeld was the chairman. The CEO was uh, a guy by the name of Caswell. And Noyce, what? Caswell. You knew him. Okay, so, the, okay, so, so basically, Noyce and Moore to make a trip. They know these two guys. They make a trip out to Detroit and convince them. Remember, this is where all the design is all done. We're ready to ramp, okay, at Burroughs. Convince them that, uh, you know, the, Noyce was good at the software compatibility pitch, okay, you know, and you got a lot of software. This, these, these products were Unix. Unix-based products, and, and so we had a lot of new software on it. Anyhow, the long and short of it was, they convinced them that the 386 would be out in six months, and that they should kill the program, National Semiconductor. And I'm at National, I get a call from our field guy, Curtis, and he says, uh, you lost the Burroughs business. I said, oh, you're crazy. We didn't lose the Burroughs business. You know, I mean, we knew all these guys, and he said, yeah, you lost it. And uh, turns out we, we did lose the business, and that was the end and, uh, of, of you know, anything. Because then Intel didn't come out in six months, but did come out in a year with the 386. You, you, and Compaq immediately, you know, took, and that, that was the end of all of us. You, you know, Zilog, mm. you know, Motorola, yeah. <laughs> we all, we, you know, and we converted at National. To, uh, you you want to know the rest of that story? Because I was at Burroughs at no, the time. No, this is my thing I'm talking about. Okay, but I was at <laughs> Burroughs at that time. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you were? Yes. I think you were the moderator. <laughs> oh, oh, oh. Control, okay. you, control you your panel. You weren't going to win. <laughs> no way you were going to win. <laughs> okay. Uh, okay, so I, I, he's really, I, I really was proud of that because it was a long struggle. Unfortunately, we were unsuccessful. Um, but we got our revenge. I won't talk about that. Uh, you know, <laughs> we got our revenge in the Pentium. So, uh, so anyhow, getting the other thing that was really uh, uh, kind of great for me uh, to work on was um, Portal Player. Portal Player made the silicon and uh, the operating system for the first iPod. And I was the chairman and interim CEO for a while of that company. Oh. And, and uh, that was exciting because we had a startup. Uh, we had a CEO who had a vision for, you know, media. Remember, and this was 2000, and memory, you know, memory couldn't put much memory on a chip at that period of time. And uh, but we had developed a platform, you know, to put media on a chip, and we had worked with IBM in San Jose who had made hard disk and they had a one inch by one inch hard disk so we could put four gigs on a player and uh, get 12 hours of music out of that thing. Anyhow, an RFQ was sent out by Apple. So we do this independently at Portal Player. Apple gets a guy named Tony Fidel who 
has been trying to peddle his idea for a music player called the, they eventually call it the iPod. And they sent out an RFQ to all the big semiconductor manufacturers. And all the semiconductor manufacturers, I'd have to say, they were consistent in saying, what a bunch of crap this is. You know, a music player, it's going to take us three years to develop this platform. And uh, we were able, uh, with Tony Fidel, and he reported to a guy by the name of John Rubenstein, who reported to uh, Jobs. We were able to go there, show them our platform. And we told uh, them that um, we could get them in production. It was August. Production by Christmas. All they had to do was the navigation software. Remember the first iPods had a circular sensor on them, OK? And yet they had to develop the navigating software. And uh, anyhow, that was great because that was done launched a company and a, a whole business that we were, you know, tied to. So that was really, really exciting, you know. Well, I, okay, I came from boroughs to nationals, okay, and when I got the national, I remember talking to Annie and so on, I just said, national should have won that shootout at Apple. National had the processor in CMOS, qualified, and they lost to Motorola, which came in with a big breadboard, which was a rack of TTL. That's all Motorola had for the 68,000 at that time, a working rack of TTL. Uh, you lost it at the marketing level and the management level. Motorola was a great marketing company, and they'd sell a whole they sent such big teams in. Motorola marketing could bring in top management. There's no question. That top management was ready for a call and then would go in. And versus Charlie Spork, who really didn't want to have much to do with marketing. But Charlie was that great manufacturing guy. Okay, I think we're ready to wrap this up. Um, before you know, we do this, anything you want to add, Nick, uh, to what we talked about? Anything? Yeah, I, I think you know the biggest, uh, as I said earlier, the, I think the biggest issue I had with RCA was this uh, devotion to SOS. I think that really, really killed us. Because yeah. we spent so much effort designing products in SOS, none of which ever made it to production. and. That was effort that could have been spent designing enhanced 1800 series products in, yep. in bulk CMOS. Uh, we did timekeeping circuits in SOS. We did an 8085 in SOS. We did a RAM IO, a ROM IO in SOS. Uh, all kinds of stuff. I mean, that was the technology. And you talk about lack of vision. Well, that was sort of anti-vision because we had somebody in the labs with an SOS vision that for some reason everybody bought into. And maybe it was a lack of knowledge, but that sort of became the technology vision that that was going to be the VLSI technology of the future. And I, th I think that's really what sunk us because we spent man years, many, many, many man years designing products in SOS that never went anywhere that could have been spent designing other products. And, and, and so that, that was sort of the, the beginning of the end, I think, uh, because by the time we tried to recover into bulk CMOS, it was too late. And the, the industry was just passing us by, and, and I think that that was the real killer. That was the real killer. But good oh. people, good architecture. Yeah. I mean, the 1800 series could have lasted forever. We could have done 16-bit versions. We could have done 32-bit versions of the same fundamental architecture, because it was a really, really good controller architecture. Yeah. And, and, you know, but spent you and I tried to get that 16-bit going, and we couldn't. Well, you know, that, that, was, that was the lack of vision. But, I mean, that was too late. Uh, you know, the industry was already starting to bypass us. I mean, we, yeah. we second sourced the 6805. I had come from and Motorola, and I <coughs> knew they were working heavily on the 16-bit version. And you couldn't move RCA, and I couldn't move RCA. And that's the result. Paul, you have any? I just want to mention, my saddest moment was actually leaving RCA in 1980, I was being recruited by GE, and I viewed GE as low-tech and RCA as the world leader in technology. 
but they gave me, you know, I ended up arguing with Welch for an hour, and I said, screw that job, and he, they made me an offer I couldn't refuse, but I was really sad to leave it because I felt that, as you said earlier, that there was this massive opportunity that was squandered. RCA could have been a leader in personal computers and flat panel TVs, all the new stuff. And it kind of, it was sad to leave that. Dick, do you have some last, any other? Yeah. Well, one of the things I just remembered that I was real happy and proud about when I left Motorola, I left a, the CMOS operation. And during the time that I was there, I was one member of this team. It was an excellent team, balanced all the way through with our production right on, right there. We started with almost zero revenue in CMOS 4000 series because they, the operation was new. When I left to come back to RCA, we had exceeded RCA in their own domain in the 4000 series logic. We had more revenue than RCA had. Okay, we became one, then they became two. And uh, this says, you know, once you have the momentum, you gotta continue it. Okay, you gotta grow, grow or die. And RCA had some <laughs> reason for giving up the growth. Yeah. You know, you know th thank all of you today for uh, describing how this 1800 series got started. And uh, that was very interesting. Paul and Nick and in uh, the 1800 family, I think we talked a lot about uh, its attributes, its uh, place in two major markets, automobile under the hood, ignition and space. And I'd like to end with a positive note, okay? We talked a lot about management, okay? And I think we were kind of in agreement that uh, the vision was lost in management. Uh, when we say management, we're talking about executive management of the corporation. Um, really failed in terms of the te taking the technology to market. Uh, but irrespective of the management incompetency, if you will, um, we still have, and I was really heartened you know, to see that we have a Hubble telescope out there who doesn't care about management. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and it's just cranking along, and it's been up there for 27 years. And I've just looked recently, there was a PBS show on some of the data of yeah. dark holes that this telescope has picked up and the, the number of galaxies galaxies around all of those stars. Uh, it's, it's contributing heavily you know, to, to the world, to society you know, with, uh, with its work over the last 27 years. So on that positive note, I think that's probably the major, one of the major things that the 1800 has done for society. I don't know of any other microprocess that has done so. Thank you, guys. Thank you, that's Dick. Uh, thanks to the panel. It's been a fascinating discussion of uh, groundbreaking, really a revolution in, in the microprocessor business and leading into uh, a lot of other areas that uh, that we're still taking advantage of today. So thanks to all of you. <laughs>